Uh, okay. Okay. But it is recording. <laughs> and then, uh, uh -huh. good afternoon, Paul. Uh, my name is Claudio, and to your right is Christian from Santiago, Chile. Let's make a formal introduction for our listeners from the studios in Fairfax City. We are very humble and grateful that Paul Vertigo accepted our invitation to our show. Paul is an American drummer. He gained recognition as a member of the Pan Metheny Group from 1983 until 2001, leaving the group to spend more time with his family and, and pursue other musical interests. Uh, Paul is very active in the field of education. He's an associate professor of jazz studies at the Roosevelt University of Chicago, seven-time Grammy Award winner, the man, the myth, the legend. Paul, welcome to the show. Thanks, Claudio. Hi, Christian. Nice to see you both. Hi. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, Paul, this has been, as, as you know, we, you know, politics are now involved. This has been a very weird year for everybody. How, how, how things are uh, going with you, your wife, your family, your creativity? How has this pandemic has affected, uh, you know, your, your world, if you will? Well, I mean, you know, we're very fortunate because so many people have lost work and can't pay their rents and so many things. I mean, you know, I've lost many gigs. You know, I have records, three records that just came out in um, Italy. I was supposed to go there. I was supposed to, you know, there's so much stuff that I lost, not, lo not only locally, but internationally. But luckily, I'm a tenured associate professor at Roosevelt University, so I'm able to teach all my classes like this via Zoom, yeah. and that's been fantastic. And I like I like technology, so you know I, I made sure I got a good microphone. You know I'm using a Shure, you know um, MV88 Plus, which is like recording quality, and it seems like the students are are fine with it. You know, um, and the difference between teaching live and teaching via zoom i mean obviously you're not seeing them in real time you know but at the same time i, I like to compare it almost like a live gig versus a recording session where a live gig you just play and whatever happens happens you know where a recording session everything is documented so it really makes you focus on on when you teach that uh, they put that up on Blackboard and, and students can watch it later, you know, so you want to make sure that everything is organized and, and very efficient. And then my wife has been lucky enough to teach, um, you know, via remote as well. And then my daughter also has her job and she's able to work remotely. So all three of us, you know, even though it's very weird, I mean, the world has been so strange and you know, so much stuff is like uncertain. We've been very lucky in the fact that we're able to do things. And even though I've lost live gigs and, and turned down some live things too, because, you know, at my age and stuff, I don't really want to play and, and take the chance on getting sick or bringing home something. But I've been able to do a lot of recording sessions. And that's that's been good too. Um, the song we were just talking about, my wife's song, uh, Love Can Conquer Hate, you know, that was done all basically kind of remotely. And, yeah. and, and it's in a way, it's kind of the future because, you know, people, if we're thinking about global warming and all that, you know, people aren't going to be able to travel the same way and pollute, you know, have a large carbon footprint, as they say. So I think as things get better and with uh, technology where the latency, you know, isn't like, where you can't play in time together, that's starting to get solved. And I, and, and so I'm positive. I, you know, I always stay positive. It's like, that's just the way I look at it, you know, not naively positive, but just if there's nothing you can complain about, if you can't change things. So you make whatever is happening in your real world at the real time, you just look at how you can make it better and accept what's there, try to fix it, fix it if you can. But there's certain things that right now, like those techno technological obstacles, people are working on that. And the future looks, I think the future looks different, but bright. Yeah, especially with the new president now, hopefully oh. as well. <laughs> My God, you know, <laughs> what can I say? You know, Ben, I love the, I love the setting there you, the, with the vinyl to your left and to the right and the seven Grammy Award. That's oh. beautiful, man. Good for you. Thank man. you. Good. Well earn it. So let's go back to the beginning. Were you born like in a in a, in a musical family? How you no. start? How can you, how it came about? I have no idea. You know, I mean, 
Um, you know, my mom used to, you know, she liked Sarah Vaughn. She would sing along Sarah Vaughn songs and we would listen to music, but no one played in my immediate family. And when I was in sixth grade, so when I was 12, my, my mom and dad and I, we moved to a new, new city called Cary, Illinois, yep. in the northwestern suburbs of Chicago. Yeah, you know. And it was funny because my mom said, oh, you should take up an instrument because she knew I loved music. And she says, just don't take up the drums. But that was what I was interested in. Oh, yeah. And I joined the school band and I could just play. I could just play. I don't know why. I mean, my band director in, in grade school was a saxophone teacher named Vern Pade, and he was really great. He taught me how to hold the sticks and read music. And I didn't even have a drum set until I was graduating uh, grade school until I was 14. So I would just play on pillows and yeah. just listen to a lot of music, play along with the radio and that. Yeah. And, and I remember most of the other students at that time had been playing in the concert band. They had been playing since they were eight, you know, and I would started 12, which is kind of late. But the first time I sat down at a friend's drum set, I was able to play the drum set right away. I don't know why. And then when I went to high school, so now I had this drum set and I used to practice along with, um, you know, the radio and just play like, you know, with the Hollies or the Beatles, but play you know, almost free, but in time. And I asked my mom if I could take drum set lessons. And she goes, no, just keep doing what you're doing, which was okay. You know, she had some faith in me, which is great. And then my high school band director, because I have a book called Turn the Beat Around. I dedicated that book to him because when I got into high school, he let me just be me. I mean, he would let me improvise on symphonies and say, yeah, I like what you're doing more than what's written. And we're friends to this day. And, you know, and that's the reason I think I became a musician. So I, w I was very interested in sports and chemistry, but it, it just graduated that I got more into music and I, you know, people started liking what I was doing. And before, you know, I was playing gigs. Um, yeah. It was just like a, not a plan, not a, you know, not a, not a thing. Like if I do this and I do this, then I'll be able to do this. No, I just went with my flow, what I love to do. Luckily, I was surrounded by people that were very supportive and talented. And one thing that led to another, then I got, you know, I got a you know, scholarship at a university and, you know, it was just very natural. It was so in a way, I always like to think about that. That's a lot of things with life is your attitude. And and also luck, you know, I mean, if you're in a bad neighborhood and, you know, you have to fight, you know, horrible things and stuff that makes it tough. I mean, the neighborhood I grew up in was, you know, middle class and um, it was just I don't know. I just consider myself very fortunate, you know, even getting the Matheny gig. I didn't did not try to get that gig. It was it wasn't like, oh, if I do this and that, I'll be able to get this gig. It was just, you know, just doing what you do. Yeah, yeah. We will be talk about your your you know your work as a solo artist with your trio and the Pathini. But uh -huh. now that you mentioned Pan Pathini, I believe that yourself and Steve Robney were were in another band. Oh and yeah. I think uh, Pat Pat Pathini saw you guys playing, and then you know, you know, well, have a conversation with you guys after that. Uh, no, well, no. I mean, Steve and I had started playing, you know, in the seventies, and we were the two, playing. The two of you went to the same school, right, Northwestern? No, right? no? no, not at oh. all. Okay. Wow. No. And it's, I know, I mean, so Steve and I just, you know, as we broke into the Chicago scene, that's how we met. Okay. And we started playing with this guitar player, Ross Trout, who was like this really great guitar player and a friend of Pat's. I think they might even been roommates for, you know, in Miami for a bit. And I was also playing with everyone in Chicago, sort of. So when Pat came after, right after Watercolors, he came to Chicago and he was doing a tour and the drummer couldn't do it. I don't even know who the drummer was. So this was before the group was really formed. And he called me to do a week of touring with him. And I turned him down. Wow. Cause I was playing with this guy, Joe Daly, a very legendary Chicago sax a tenor player. He was also a, a, a incredible teacher. He taught you know, like Dave Sanborn took lessons, John Clemmer, you know, all these people. And, I had been playing with him for a couple of years by that time. And we finally got like the biggest gig that we ever had, which was the jazz showcase, which is the second oldest club 
uh, in the United States after the Village Vanguard, the second oldest jazz club. And so I didn't want to, since I was playing with Joe, I wanted to stay loyal to Joe, you know. And that particular group that we played the showcase was Muhal Richard Abrams, you know, one of the founding fathers of the AACM. And I think Steve Laspina was playing bass. So I turned Pat down. And that was, you know, a lot of people think I was crazy, but, you know, I was just being loyal. And I think later Pat actually said that that was a good sign of, the, of who I was, I guess. And then after that, you know, I went to see Pat play a couple times. I didn't, I just said hello afterwards. You know, we barely talked. And then one night in, um, in what was 1982, I was with this band, the Simon and Bard group. And Steve and I had done some records for them as well. Uh, but I was on tour with them and Steve was playing with Pat by that time. And they played some concert in Portland the same night I was playing with Simon and Bard group in Portland in a club. And so afterwards, um, S Steve and Pat came down to hear the band. And, you know, I, so I just said hi, didn't even really talk to them that much. And we played, we played well, played the way we normally played. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, I got a call that, after Nana Vasconcelos left, they were going to audition a percussionist. And so would I come out and play drums for the audition? You know, and I said, sure. So I flew to Boston and we, I played for the audition, you know, the percussionist audition. It lasted like a half hour. And then we jammed for like, God, I think we, we had to get like almost 12 hours. We, this thing lasted. And at one point it was cold. You know, it was like this warehouse in Boston and at one point, you know, Pat said, hey, you know, we just want to talk. Can you go out, you know, go out in the lobby or wherever? I said, sure. And I'm freezing. And they talked. And the next thing they know said, well, you know, because I didn't know the music, believe it or not. I didn't really listen, you know, to that. You know, I, I liked Bright Size Life a lot. Watercolors wasn't my favorite. So um, Pat says, well, man, I'm going to be coming back to Chicago on New Year's Day. So why don't you learn some of the music and we'll play again? And so... Steve Rodby and I got together. Steve kind of taught me some of the music a little bit. And then we jammed like, you know, at, it was at some room in, in some hotel downtown Chicago. And then, you know, it was fun. Yeah, I knew some of the music a little bit by then. And then Pat goes, you know, great. And then a couple of days later, he says, do you have a passport? And I said, no. He said, get one. We're, you're going to Europe with us. And that's how that whole thing happened. Wow, man! Crazy, what about isn't that? it? What about that? What about that? Yeah, that totally, was... totally natural. Yeah, you know. Um, I, I guess I mean they must have liked what I did at the, at, yeah. you know, because I, I know I heard I heard people say that like Lyle really played well with me and just a couple things that they thought I played, you know, whatever, you know, who knows why people get gigs, why bands. You know, change personnel yeah. sometimes for, you know, because sometimes people grow out of the band or the band wants to change directions. Who knows? I mean, even with me, I mean, you know, Imaginary Day was the last record I did with them. Then, you know, I got three Grammy nominations and won two Grammys. And then, you know, by that time, I was kind of doing different things. Two pets started wanting to go different directions. And so, you know, I had my daughter. You know, and so it was like, wow, you know, it's so it was a natural process to move on. And so I'm happy. I'm happy where I went. I think probably Pat's happy where they went, you know, because Antonio's a great drummer, you know, so life, you know, and I've been lucky in my life. I mean, Barb and I have been together since like 1976. Good for you. you know? mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and like the gig at Roosevelt is, is going, it's on, I'm on 18 years there. And before that, even though I was, not full time at Northwestern University. I was there 16 years. Yeah. And so uh, many of my relationships have last, lasted a long time, which, you know, that's yeah. great because sometimes, yeah. you know, people get a gig and they'll do one tour and then whatever, or you'll do one record with someone but never do another record again with them. Yeah. You know, I've done a lot of records where I've done multiple records with people too. Yeah. And you know, again, I don't know why. I mean, you know, I'd like to think I know why, but, you know, it's just, I think if you try to do the right thing in life, hopefully things will happen, you know. Uh, bingo, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you nail it, man. Absolutely, man. You do good things in life and uh, good karma, if you will, comes around and then you do well. You have, you know, and, that's, the, and that's the other thing. 
Yeah. You were well recommended by Steve Robbie. I mean, you knew the guy. I'm sure I was. I mean, there was no Yeah, I'm sure there. Steve had a lot to do with it because, you know, after I got the gig, then I really got together with Steve before we flew to Europe for the first time because I had never been to Europe before because I didn't even have a passport. So, yeah. you know, there were no drum charts, so to speak. So, you know, Steve and I would just play down the songs and he would kind of tell me what the sections were or whatever, you know. But Pat wanted me to play like me, too. You know, Danny's great. You know, Pat loved Danny, too. But, Pat, you know, Pat wanted me to sound like me, you know. Right, right. And, and so that whatever direction we went in after the original quartet, we went in, you know, went in that direction. And, you know, I, I played a lot with Mark Egan, too, you know, like in the, in the um, Larry Coriel trio, you know, Mark and I are really good friends. So it's just, you know. It is what it is, as they say, you know? Yep, good, man. Go ahead, Christian. Well, sir, you know, it's been uh, 24 years since the last time we met here wow. in Santiago. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's when you gave me this, even uh, with an autograph inside. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. Uh -huh. uh, I was, I was, back then I was in Futuro, uh, the FM station, and I played uh, Don't Look Back from this album. I really Written by my album. wife. Oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> look at that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you ever look back at those days? I mean, well, you always carry a little bag of memories, don't you? Wherever you go, I suppose. Absolutely. You know, and my wife and I love Chile. You know, I have really fond memories of being there. I'd love to come back, you know. And it was the, the most fun for me with Pat's band was Secret Story when my wife was in the band. So that we were touring together because... You know, I love being home. I'm very much of a homebody. So when I would be on tour, especially back then, you know, it was very difficult to call people. It was very expensive to stay in touch. Now you can just, you know, you can see each other via Skype or Zoom or, you know, you can FaceTime. Back then, you know, when you went away, you might talk to each other every few days because it was so expensive. So when Barb was with us, and this is before we had our daughter, I would have stayed on the road forever with that band, with her, you know, because it was great sharing all those places. And, and you know, because by that time, you know, when you tour a lot, <laughs> even if you get to a big city like Paris or whatever, you've seen many things. So a lot of times if you're by yourself, you know, it's like you might want to just sleep, you know, just save your energy. But then when you're with someone you love all of a sudden that who hasn't been to those places, it's like, yeah, let's go to the Louvre. Let's go, you know to all these different places and sightsee again so it, it it was so fun it was great and you know just to play because when you're on stage you you know i could look back at her and we could smile it was it was fantastic you know uh -huh. i don't know if claudio allows me to share a screen to show you a picture do you yeah. uh i just want to show you a very old picture uh, okay i'm disabled so i cannot oh well n n never mind Can never mind it, uh, or? yeah it, the house well, is think disabled I think, yeah. uh, Christian, I think they have to, are you co-host? I think you have to be a host to share this or co-host. Uh, so, Claudio, uh, you, pr you probably want to make Christian. Can share, yeah, we can share. Yeah, I did. All right. It doesn't, me, yeah, here it is. Uh, okay. There you are. I don't see it, actually. Oh, there yeah, we are. Uh, oh, my God. Wow. wow. <laughs> that's unbelievable. Well, that's me in the center. You know the yeah. guy to your left. I yeah. mean, to, yeah, that, that, that looks like you. That yeah. looks like me. At least it yeah. used to. Hey, you did <laughs> yeah. have a lot more hair than me back then. Yeah, well, <laughs> I just sh I just shaved my head. I mean, I I didn't shave it. You know, when this COVID thing started, uh, we were in in the backyard of my home, and my wife and my daughter Talia and her boyfriend Avi were there. We were just having dinner, and you know, I've had a ponytail forever, and I just said shave my head and film it so they did you know i had never shaved my head before and even growing a beard right now you know i i've had a goatee for a while just you know to look like a professor kind of but now i'm just growing a full beard because you know winter time is coming sure. and you know it's, it's i like changing my look i really do i, I think it's, it's i don't want to get stuck looking the same way all the time you know Absolutely. yep i i just wanted to say uh, paul well uh so good to talk to you again after such a long time. I was going to mention that the first time you came here back in 1980, uh, 
89, was it? 86? We were talking about that with Claudio. I saw the band on the bus uh, parking at the, at the front of the National Stadium entrance because he played in a tennis court back then. I know. It was, it was uh, December the 21st, a few days before Christmas. Yeah. And I, I remember I saw you like, what is this? Where, where are we going to? It was the first time the band was here. Then you came back in 93. Then in 96, that's when we went. We had the chance to have a dinner. We, we, go, we went for dinner together with right. the promoter. And uh, you showed me the pictures of your daughter, I guess. I uh, remember that. Uh, so uh, I know you have good memories of places like this. And we also wish that you could come back someday after all this over, all this pandemic thing is over. So uh, do you have any special memories of any of those occasions where you came to Chile? Well, I mean, kind of many, actually, you know. I, I remember the gigs, especially, w w w you know, later on when it, we played outside, it was really cold. You know, the one in the tennis court, I just remember that because of the Pinochet horrible stuff that happened there. So we were very aware of what grounds we were on, you know. It was, it was like red clay tennis court kind of thing. I remember playing there. But I remember the ones that were sort of like maybe an hour outside, an hour outside of Santiago, those yeah. those were those were great, and you know people are in their winter coats, and we and we were almost in our coats playing, but the audience was always fantastic. And then you know, it sounds funny to say, but you know the Chilean wine and the food and just everything. You know, I I, got, I came back to Chile as you know to do drum clinics. Um, I've done I did still I think I did one or two gigs with Larry Coriel there. I don't know if you know that, but I I've, I've been there a number of times outside of Pat Metheny. No, I really I wasn't aware of that. Oh, maybe yeah. I remember I maybe I remember some uh, workshop, but not the Larry Correal thing you mentioned. Really, no. Yeah. Uh, what, what was that? That would have been. Let's see. That would have been with Mark Egan. So that probably would have been sometimes in the early two thousands. I think you know. Yeah. 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 There was there was a when you came here the last time you came in ninety six with the Pat Metheny group. There were not so many concerts here. It was it, it was like a big thing when somebody came. But oh. then, uh, like uh, in the last twenty years or so, many many shows uh, began, you know, happening, taking place. People coming here, so it's not it's not very difficult that you miss one of those occasions. You cannot be mm -hmm. there in in every single show. Now, I was right. going to ask you, Paul, uh, how could how much space uh, could you gain? For your own ideas after the Pat Metheny group era, like uh, uh, how how it all developed after this album. Well, I mean, okay, I mean, this sounds weird to say, but you know, the Paul Wertico in the Pat Metheny group is only a small part of Paul Wertico. You know, I was playing what I thought, and I guess Pat thought made the music successful. Okay. Because, I mean, I teach my students that that's our job, basically, is to serve the music and make the music successful. But, you know, I didn't have a lot of solos. You know, most of the music was with sequencers. You know, everything was so there, there was improvisation, but not mega improvisation. Like because, you know, I come from bands that are 100 percent improvised, <laughs> like, you know, Earwax Control and my band, Word of Cocaine and Gray. We have seven records out. And everything's 100% improvised. You know, I have duo records. There's a great duo record, a really great sax player named Frank Catalano. And, and, and I'm just about to release a duo um, CD with uh, great, well, Larry Gray, who's part of uh, Word of Cocaine Gray. He's a great bassist, cellist, guitar player. So in many ways, people really don't know who I am. They only think that I play cymbals. You know, it's like I'm not that... I mean, I am that when I'm doing that. And that's, that's what you do. You know, to keep a job is like you have to fulfill what the music needs of you to do, you know. But in many ways, you know, sometimes it's difficult because even the in and the out, all those records like that, you know, they might have sold a couple thousand copies, you know. So, like, when, when you're in a band, like, that's selling a million copies, like Matheny's band, more people are going to know you for that. That's just the way it is. It's just like an actor. Like if you're an actor and, you know, you're in a movie that that's a, a hit movie and, you know, if, say it's a comedy and everyone thinks, oh, this guy's really funny. Then they don't know that you could be a serious actor and do many other things outside of that because maybe those other movies 
weren't successful or everyone still thinks of you as a comedian. So to me, that's been one of the, you know, it's not frustrating because in any business, especially the music business, it's fantastic to be known for anything because there's millions of wonderful players that never get any recognition. So I'm proud of what I did with Pat. I think those records are historic records that, you know, can't ever be taken away. But it's really funny because a lot of people, when they hear me play jazz, in fact, when I got on the cover of um, Modern Drummer in, uh, what was it, 1995, the year my daughter was born, Bill Mokowski, who wrote the uh, article, came to the Chicago Jazz Festival and he heard me playing like straight ahead. And he goes, man, I didn't know you played like that. And I'm like, yeah, I've been playing like that my whole life. You know, when people hear me in rock bands, they go, wow, we didn't know you played like that. You know, so I'm I feel very fortunate to have, a, 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 you know, it's a musical reputation. So that's great. But I do feel sometimes people don't really know. And one time when I did a, a clinic in Chile, actually, one of the guys came up to me afterwards in the audience and says, you know, I was going to ask you to try to demonstrate playing all the 26 drum rudiments because I didn't think you could. But after you, he heard me play, then he goes, obviously, you can. So a lot of people have no idea that I could play a role with one foot that I can, you know, play. I mean, it's, it's very crazy. It's, but it, again, I'm lucky to be known for anything, you know, and probably I wonder if I'd be doing this interview if I wasn't with Pat, you know what I'm saying? So a lot of times you're famous for something, but then you're also typecast and that's what happened. And a lot of times after the shows, you know, Pat and I would go and jam with local musicians and play, you know, standards and play that. And people were like, wow, we didn't know you could solo. It's like, of course I can solo, you know? I mean, there's stuff that's never been released. There's a great trio thing with Ross Trout and Jaco Pistorius in the studio one time. It was, it's from 1977. And I, I haven't released it because, you know, and I'm so proud of it. I was like 20, I was like 23 years old. I was 23 years old at the time, and I'm really proud of that. But unless it gets released, no one's ever going to hear it, you know. Do you have the masters, the tapes? Oh, well, I, I do. But it, it, but on that one, Ross Trout was the one because he knew he knew Jocko from uh, Miami. So I, I felt like, you know, I don't know if, if I need to get permission. But I mean, I just, you know, this COVID thing has made me you know, not only practice more, and, but I've had more time to listen, read, but I've also been going through all these old recordings that I have. I have this great weekend with my quintet with Lyle Mays playing at the Green Mill. Mm -hmm. And we're playing all originals and straight ahead, like, you know, stuff like, uh, you know, from the Blue Note catalog. And Lyle sounds amazing on it. So I'm wondering if I should start releasing some of these things because before I die, I want people to know that I'm not just the happy cymbal player, you know? Right. Yeah, you, you sure should. You sure should. Now, I, I was going to ask you precisely, uh, Paul, did you ever feel that your individual creativity or flow could not really happen? In Well, I, after all you said, it might become like uh, obvious, but maybe you would have, like, have to spend time, time already passed. Uh, like you never didn't really have the chance to show yourself. That's what you say, yeah? Uh, yeah, but, but I showed myself working for what the music needed, you know? Exactly. So in other words, it wasn't about me being, when I was in the band. You know, because some, some groups, especially if you're playing like the, the, the right. totally improvised stuff, everyone's 100%, you know, in the communication. With this, you know, it was Pat and Lyle's compositions, you know, it's more featured, you know, like I had like maybe one solo and maybe then a duo with, you know, the percussionist. But, you know, Pat would have like 23 solos that night, you know, and Lyle might have, you know, nine solos and Steve Rodby would have one, you know. So it wasn't about that, though, because people didn't come to hear us just solo. They came to hear what was recorded, those great compositions, the great arrangements, the great production. And so I never felt like frustrated, you know, because that was my job. I was happy. And at the same time, you know, I'm, I was very fortunate because, you know, we were one of the top jazz groups in the world at that time. So, you know, we're flying first class, staying in, you know, great hotels, having thousands of people come because 
you know, and I don't feel like I sold out because I did like the music and I liked it. I, I was proud to be on stage. With